Today, we will take on the controversial topic related to agriculture, specifically the use of genetically modified organisms as crop plants. And genetically modified organisms are often abbreviated as GMOs. In the background here, we see golden rice. And golden rice is a genetically modified rice form that we'll talk about in just a little bit. We'll start today by talking about non-GMO techniques, or traditional ways that we modify plants, usually by breeding plants with different traits together. And this is a technique that works for closely related species. We'll then move on to talk about techniques for genetic engineering. And even though in both cases we are genetically modifying plants, we'll reserve the use of the term genetically modified organisms specifically for genetically engineered plants. This involves cases where we take genes out of one organism and we move them and insert them into another organism using techniques besides normal breeding. We'll talk about some common changes in GMO crops. In other words, what kinds of genes are we inserting for what purposes? We will allude to the debate about the safety of GMOs and I will give you a reading that talks about this further. And then we'll talk a little bit about where GMOs are increasingly common in our food supply, and we can think about where else they might be used. So let's start with traditional techniques that we would typically use to modify crop plants, um, either before we had GMOs, or simply because now, even though we have GMOs, some traditional techniques are faster and easier. So one technique is to simply breed within the species. And this involves finding different varieties of a given plant species that have different traits we might be interested in. In this hypothetical example, we might have bean plants that are small but produce large bean pods, and we want those large bean pods. We might have other plants that are larger, but the particular beans that they make tend to be on the small side. And perhaps a farmer would prefer to grow large plants so they can get some more beans and have those beans be large. So it wants the size here and the bean size of this variety. We could cross those together and make an F1, and then we could select um, among the F2 and other offspring of later crosses, we could continue selecting um, until we get a plant that is both large, like this one on right, and has large beans, like this one on left. In that way, we genetically combine the information in both of these plants into some new variety. And we've been doing this intentionally or unintentionally for millennia. We can use a very similar technique, basically the same technique, to move genes between closely related species. Now this will only work if the species are so closely related that they are able to interbreed. If they can, then we use very much the same approach we just said. We start by breeding the two species together, and we'll get an F1. We can make F2s from that F1, so a second round of crossing. And then we can look at the offspring and look for ones that have combinations of the traits that we want. An example where this has been used is the production of a crop called tridecale. Tridecale is a hybrid between wheat and rye. These are both grains, so they are both grasses. Wheat is a plant that we grow partly because it has a high yield. It makes a lot of seeds and a lot of seed mass. Rye is another uh, grain that we grow, partly because it's tolerant of growing in poorer conditions than wheat accepts, and also because it tends to be more disease resistant than wheat. And so tridecale was bred as a hybrid between the two, and in those hybrids we've selected for individuals that have larger seeds than wheat and also higher protein content than wheat. And another marketing feature of tridecale is that it has a lower gluten content. And for various reasons, many food consumers now 
um, try to avoid eating gluten, and so a lower gluten crop is deemed desirable. Up here in the picture, we can see what wheat seeds look like on the left, and then rye seeds, which you can see are considerably larger in the middle, and tridecale, which are also on the large size on the right-hand side here. And so tridecale is continued, there are continued breeding programs for it, and we might start to see it even more in our food system sometime in the future. Another example, the slide I pulled from an earlier lecture, is hybridization being used to combine traits from one species with traits of another species. We talked about this when we talked about the American chestnut tree, which we said was devastated by a fungal blight that was introduced from Asia in the early 1900s. And we said that the North American species lacks resistance to chestnut blight, but Asian tr trees tend to be resistant. So what we've done is we've crossed the two, they were interfertile, we got offspring, and then we selected for offspring that looked and closely matched the American trees in most ways, but still had the resistance to chestnut blight from the Asian trees. And so again, we've combined two species together. So everything we've talked about so far are traditional breeding techniques that um, both advocates and detractors of GMO would say are reasonable techniques well outside of that term. There's some problems with these traditional techniques. The biggest one is that the techniques only work when we can cross the species together and get seeds to form. Now, barriers to hybridization can be very strong, and so only the most closely related species are able to hybridize. And sometimes even very closely related species cannot produce seeds together um, if one is pollen from one is used to fertilize ovules on the other. And for various reasons, it's often desirable to move traits much further distances among species that are not close relatives. So to do so, we would need some additional techniques. And this is where genetic engineering comes in. Genetic engineering refers generally to laboratory techniques that allow DNA or genes to be moved between species. This movement could be between different plant species, for example, but it could also be further apart. So we could use genetic engineering to move genes from bacteria to plants or from animals to plants, etc. This is an example where we're moving genes between two distantly related animals from a glow-in-the-dark, well, a jellyfish that produces um, a protein that glows in the dark, we've moved that into fish. And apparently you can now buy these fish as pets, and apparently they are marketed as glowfish. We've also moved that same gene, which is called green fluorescent protein, into plants. And so here you can see this plant, probably under ultraviolet light, is glowing green. This is from the GFP protein, again from the jellyfish. And it looks cool, but in practice we use this a lot in uh, plant biotechnology experiments to be able to tell where we have successfully inserted a gene from another organism. We simply insert the green fluorescent protein gene too, and then if we see that a part of the plant is glowing green, then that must be a part of the plant where this protein is being expressed. As a result, other proteins that we inserted with it are presumably being expressed in the same areas. How do we accomplish moving genes between species? Well, there are a few different techniques. The first technique that we'll talk about is called a DNA particle gun. And this is basically what it sounds like. It was initially done with gunpowder. Um, in this example here, um, the force is instead of gunpowder, it's coming from uh, helium gas that gets released. Either way, the basic idea is you start by getting the DNA that you want. So you use other molecular techniques to accumulate copies of that DNA. And you coat the DNA with a metal 
Um, in the example here, the metal is gold. It could be tungsten as well. Then we are going to expose those little particles of metal-coated DNA to a strong force, um, and they will get literally shot downwards into plant cells. We'll then take those plant cells and we'll culture them with nutrients in a broth, and they will grow sort of like bacteria would grow in a broth. After they've had time to grow, we'll then take them out of the broth and put them in a dish and add plant hormones um, while continuing to provide nutrients. And that will allow these little uh, plant particles to start differentiating into individual growing plants or plantlets. And some of those plants, if we're lucky, will have picked up this DNA that we shot into the plant material. And if they did, then they may express the genes and be genetically modified. A second technique that I think is used more commonly for plants is called agrobacterium transformation. Transformation simply means moving genes um, from one organism to another. Agrobacterium, as the name suggests, is a bacteria, and it is one that is um, naturally able to infect plants and influence plant growth. So in this picture, you can see the bacteria. They're these little rod-shaped um, organisms, and this is a plant cell, and you can see the bacteria are attaching to it. In nature, what this bacteria does is cause these gall-like formations in this example on the root of a plant. So part of the life cycle of agrobacterium um, involves, or part of the way it gets its nutrition is by influencing plant growth. And it does this in part by inserting DNA into plant cells. So it has all of the machinery it needs to accomplish this. And we use its machinery um, for our own ends to do this. So let's start by looking at the bacteria. Here's the whole bacterium. And inside the bacteria, you can see there's some DNA in one large chromosome that all bacteria have. But bacteria often also carry these small additional chromosomes called plasmids. And plasmids typically just have a few genes on them. In this case, to genetically engineer a plant, we are going to set up this um, plasmid to have the gene that we want to add to the plant. So maybe the four right here is where we put in the specific DNA we want the plant to express. There's also a couple of other genes and features on this plasmid. We'll only worry about one of them. Another gene on this plasmid is going to have to code for proteins that cause antibiotic resistance. Let me fix that. Okay, good. It has an antibiotic resistance gene on it. And we'll see in a minute why that's important. Now we've got the gene in our bacteria, and we can grow lots of the bacteria. So really, that means we have a lot of copies of that plasmid around, too. Now we need to get the bacteria to move that plasmid from themselves into the plant. And we'll do this, as the picture here shows, literally by dipping a growing plant into a solution with that bacteria growing. So we've inserted the DNA um, into our plasmid. We've inserted the plasmid into the bacteria. We now infect the plants with the bacteria. And that's what's shown here. When we've done so, then the bacteria can transfer the DNA from that plasmid into a plant cell. And they have um, already ways of forming these connections and getting the DNA across. Inside the plant cell, if we are lucky, that DNA will move to the nucleus, and if it moves to the nucleus, it can be incorporated into the plant's DNA. So you know that plants have multiple chromosomes. It will end up, hopefully, on one of those chromosomes in a section where it will be able to be expressed, and proteins will be able to be made based on the DNA sequence.
Now there's a couple of different variations here, but we'll focus on one of the more useful variations and one of the easier ones to understand. In this variation, we are going to hope that the plant eventually makes um, seeds, so it, hopefully it makes ovules as well as pollen that have this DNA that we're adding. Basically, when we dip the plant in, like we showed on this previous slide, we do it when the plant is still quite young. And we hope that some of the cells up near the growing tip become infected and acquire the DNA that we're trying to add. If they do, then because plants grow from meristems, that means all subsequent cells that are descended from those infected cells will also have the DNA that we have added. And eventually some of those cells may differentiate in a flower, and when the flower is formed, then that same DNA will be used to make the ovules in the flower as well as the pollen that is in that flower. So if we get our timing right, some of the tissues um, are going to be transformed and those tissues will make eggs and pollen. And then if we're lucky, that pollen will fertilize some of those eggs and we will end up with seeds that now have the trait that we're interested in. In this plant that we initially transformed, only a small section of it would have the gene that we added. But if we can get that into the seed, then because the entire growing plant is descended from that seed, all of the cells in the growing plant will have the gene that we added. And so what we see here is a representation of seeds from one of our transformed plant. And the seeds here are these blue ovals. And some of them have grown, and those that have grown have the potential to contain the genetic modification. The problem is that we need a way of separating the seeds that have the genetic modification from the seeds that come from the same plant but happen not to have the genetic modification, and those will be the vast majority of the seeds. So here's how we're going to do that. Recall that I said that when we designed that plasmid that we looked at a few slides ago, we said one gene was for the DNA that we care about adding, but one gene is for antibiotic resistance. So if we come back here, what we're going to do is we're going to plant these seeds in a petri dish that has a medium in it, and we're going to add antibiotics to that medium. That antibiotics are going to prevent the growth of most seeds. Most seeds wouldn't be able to grow with the antibiotics that we use. However, those seeds that have acquired the antibiotic resistance gene will be able to grow, and those will be the same seeds that also acquired the gene that we are interested in adding. So by virtue of growth here, we know that these three now carry the gene that we're interested in, and we can then use these and see if they have the traits that we want um, related to that gene, and if so, we can subsequently breed these plants with other plants to get them into varieties that we especially want for some agricultural reason. That then is a summary of agrobacterium transformation. It's a widely used approach, probably the most important way that we have traditionally done genetic engineering on plants. There is also a new approach, and I should number this three. This new approach is extremely powerful and is probably the direction genetic engineering is going, both for plants as well as for um, animals, and that might even include humans. This approach is called CRISPR. And I'm not going to go into the details because it gets kind of complicated, but the general idea for CRISPR is that bacteria have a defense system. And part of their defense system involves recognizing sequences of DNA and being able to modify them. And so we have figured out ways of taking those genes from the bacterial defenses and modifying them ourselves in a way that allows us to insert specific genes into organisms with much less guesswork than either the gene gun approach or the agrobacterium transformation.
So the problem with, um, for example, agrobacterium transformation is it will add the gene somewhere in the genome, but we don't have very much control about where. With CRISPR, we can start to be much more specific about what change we want to make and where in the genome we want it made. And so this technology is really revolutionizing molecular biology, and you'll probably see this mentioned increasingly in, let's say, newspaper or uh, magazine articles. We're going to move on now. We've talked about three different ways that genetic engineering can occur. Let's talk about what traits we add when we genetically engineer um, plants and with a special focus on crop plants. There are three major categories for modification. The first is herbicide tolerance. So we like to use herbicides as a way of controlling weeds. It's much less work than going through and weeding by hand. The problem is that most herbicides will affect the crops we're trying to grow as well as the weeds growing around them. If we can genetically engineer the plants to be tolerant to herbicides, then we can control the weeds in a field by spraying the whole field, including our crop plants. But our crop plants, which are now tolerant, aren't harmed. So this is a really easy way of being able to control weeds compared to mechanical control. There's many different, um, obviously there's many herbicides, and there are multiple ones for which we have engineered herbicide tolerance. But Roundup is still by far the most common. We'll talk about Roundup coming up. And so you'll hear about Roundup resistant crops um, frequently. A second trait we engineer for is insect resistance. So we can control insects by spraying pesticides, but spraying pesticides can be expensive, and there's a risk to the person spraying them of exposure, plus those pesticides could run off and harm insects that we don't want to harm. So if we can make the plant produce its own pesticides, then it stays more or less internal to the plant, at least compared to spraying it on and there might be the potential for less harm. So for insect resistance, um, the good news is that we don't have to spray. The bad news is that the plant then contains the pesticide um, as part of its makeup. And so if this is a pesticide that could be harmful to those who eat it, that would be a problem. So something important when we engineer for insect resistance is making sure the pesticide that's produced by the plant is either not harmful to humans or whichever animal is eating the crop, or if it is harmful, making sure that the parts of the plant we eat are not parts that express this pesticide. The most common example of insect resistance engineering is engineering plants to produce Bt toxin. When we talked about um, organic farming, we said that Bt toxin was one of the chemicals that is sprayed onto plants. It is natural because it's made by bacteria, so organic farmers are allowed to use it. But we can also use it in a conventional setting by taking the genes from the bacteria, inserting them into the plant, and allowing the plant to make its own Bt toxin. A third set of traits we modify in GMO crops is the nutritional profile hopefully in a way that makes them more nutritious for either humans or whichever kind of animal is being fed that crop. Let's go back and talk a little bit more about Roundup, which we mentioned on the previous slide. Roundup is a name, it's a trade named, in other words, it's trademarked for glyphosate. Um, and glyphosate is a broad spectrum herbicide. Broad spectrum means that it kills most plants that it's sprayed on. It's not specific to one plant group. The way it does this is by preventing the plants from synthesizing three important types of amino acids. As you should recall, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So if the plant can't make these amino acids, then they can't make the proteins. And if they can't make the proteins because most things that a plant or any organism does involves proteins, then that plant would be unable to survive. The kinds of amino acids that are affected by um, 
glyphosate are ones that have these ring structures on them. And there are three. This is just one example. It's phenylalanine. But the process of making this ring structure involves some enzymes, and glyphosate interferes with those enzymes. We engineer plants to be resistant to Roundup by engineering a different pathway that allows the plants with the engineering to make amino acids like this, even if they are sprayed by glyphosate. And so they are no longer susceptible to harm, the other plants in the field are, and now we have a way of growing the plants, um, even if they are sprayed. This is an important innovation in agriculture because if we can control weeds without having to disc or plow, then we can do no-till agriculture. So plowing and disking are two techniques where we basically disturb the surface of the soil and in so doing, we kill weeds and we bring other weed seeds to the surface so they can start growing. Once they start growing, we plow or disc again to try to kill them again. So those are effective ways of controlling weeds. The problem is that it really, um, in turning over the soil, it loosens the soil, and that can encourage erosion. As we've talked about already, erosion is bad because it first removes soil, and that reduces nutrient availability. Second, that eroded soil often ends up in waterways where it adds nutrients that are undesirable. Additionally, plowing and disking results in the loss of organic matter. When the soil gets turned, then the remaining organic matter in the soil gets broken down more quickly because it's more exposed to sunlight, warmth, and water. We want to retain organic matter in the soil because, as we talked about when we talked about soil, this organic matter is good at holding on to water and it's good at holding on to nutrients plus it usually is a source of nutrients itself. So it's a big advantage if we can do no-till agriculture because we don't have these two problems. And we can only do it if we can control weeds, such as by having genetically modified plants that are not susceptible to, um, to herbicides. Now there's a problem. This is a great idea, but when we start using a herbicide a lot, then that imposes selection on the weeds. The weeds that are best able to resist the herbicide do best in the field, and they leave behind the most offspring. And if this happens over many generations, eventually we can unintentionally select weeds that are highly resistant to the herbicides that we're using. We've been using glyphosate for enough years now that several kinds of weeds have started to evolve resistance. This is just the case of artificial selection, like we talked about earlier in the semester when we talked about natural and artificial selection. So we now have weeds that even when we spray glyphosate, they are able to survive. And I'll just shrink this a bit. This is one example. This is fleabane. And there are now flea banes that can grow in fields even when they are sprayed with Roundup. There are also several other weeds that can do so, and so this means the usefulness of Roundup-ready crops is already starting to diminish. Presumably one way of dealing with that is by then figuring out some other um, ways that we can engineer herbicide-resistant for other herbicides, and we can switch to other herbicides. The third way that we had talked about, um, or the third set of traits that we engineer for is better nutrition. The poster child for this is golden rice. We mentioned golden rice at the start of today's lecture, and we said that it was engineered to deal with a nutrient deficiency. Specifically, golden rice is genetically modified to make beta carotene. Beta carotene is what we'd get from eating carrots or green leafy vegetables, and it is a precursor of vitamin A. A lack of vitamin A is an important nutrient deficiency in much of the developing world. And in some parts of the world, rice is one of the major sources of calories and nutrients. The problem is that if individuals are eating 
a lot of rice but not enough um, green leafy vegetables, then they can lack an adequate supply of beta carotene. And so researchers several years ago engineered rice with the necessary enzymes to be able to make beta carotene. You can see the result here, this orange yellowish colored rice. Now, this has gotten substantially far in the process of development. What individuals are doing now is hybridizing the genetically engineered rice with this trait. They are hybridizing it with local varieties of rice that are good for growing in many different environments around the world. Those varieties of rice then that are being bred with traditional breeding, they'll still be genetically engineered. They'll still have this orange color but though it might be well suited to a highland rice field or a lowland rice field in a warm or a cold place. And hopefully sometime in the next few years, we'll start to see this rice be available commercially. Another example, this isn't exactly engineering for nutrition, but it's engineering for a trait that's going to make our food last longer. And the example here is apples that do not brown. So you've probably all experienced finding an apple that's a little bit old or bruised and it has started to brown. Browning happens as a result of an enzymatic reaction. Um, the enzyme is polyphenol oxidase, which they're abbreviating here simply as PPO. And this diagram, by the way, is from Arctic apples, which is producing these genetically engineered apples. So polyphenol oxidase would normally cause browning. The idea here is that the researchers have genetically modified the apples to have reduced levels of polyphenol oxidase. As a result, they would brown more slowly. That is hoped to then increase the shelf life um, or reduce the amount of bruising that might occur as a result of injury. And I'm not sure where this is in the development pipeline, whether you can buy these now or whether they're still at the stage of developing and increasing numbers of plants. Now, one concern that is often raised about GMOs is safety. Um, we already talked about debates in organic and conventional agriculture about the relative safety of both techniques. And so similar debates happen with regards to genetic modifications. Instead of talking here about whether it's safe or not, I'm going to point you to a couple of articles. First, your book talks about this in the one page from the reading that is about GMOs. Uh, there's a few paragraphs about safety. In addition, I'm going to point you to a, two articles I'm providing for you, one from Scientific American and one from Smithsonian that both um, provide um, multiple views about safety issues. And I'm going to ask you, after reading those articles, to provide some feedback about whether you think they would be safe and whether you would be willing to eat them. I will not share my opinion because I don't want to bias you here. And then the last thing we'll look at is the adoption of GMOs. So at this point in our food system, there are GMOs ab abundant in the United States, less abundant but still present in other parts of the world. So this graph shows some different GMO plants, and this is just from 1996 to 2011, so these trends have continued, but it shows some of the most common and most agriculturally important plants that um, are planted with GMOs. The y-axis is the percent of planted acres, so back in 1996, um, there were 0% or just a few percent of acreage in GMOs. What we can see for soybeans is that we are now near 100% of soybeans in the U.S. that are grown with genetically modified seed. For cotton, we are up near 75%. Um, for corn, we're also up well above uh, 50%. So since corn and soy are very important as food crops um, for foods that we eat, and also they're important for foods that we feed to livestock, this means that a lot of our food system is in fact 
relying on GMOs. GMOs are also used in some other crops like rapeseed, which we use to make canola oil. Um, there are some summer squash, so yellow squash or zucchini that are genetically modified. There have been genetically modified tomatoes on the market, although my understanding is they weren't very popular for other reasons. Um, and there are several other crops as well that are GMO. Most of our fruits and vegetables still are not GMO, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this trend continue into the future. And we'll end with some thoughts about GMOs more generally. I'm just going to fix this here. First, because we are getting better and better at genetic modifications, I expect to see an increase in genetically modified crops through time. Um, I expect that at some time in our life, this will be the norm, not the exception. Second, we didn't talk about this, but one interesting use of GMOs is that they can be used to cause plants to produce um, valuable pharmaceuticals. You can imagine the field of a plant that's really just harvested in order to extract some drug from that plant. Proponents of GMOs argue that they can benefit conservation. If we can genetically engineer plants to grow with less water or to grow more efficiently in a small amount of space, then just like we talked about with conventional agriculture, uh, proponents would argue that we could then use the additional space for conservation and that would be beneficial um, to, to the ecosystems. On the flip side, there's also a risk of GMOs harming natural systems if the genes that we have genetically modified jump into either weeds or wild plants. For example, imagine if the genes for glyphosate resistance jumped into weeds. Then suddenly we would have a weed that has very quickly evolved complete resistance to glyphosate. Right now the weeds that are resistant have become resistant via other mechanisms, not the ones that we engineered into the plants. Similarly, if a gene were to jump into wild plant populations, then we might be changing nature in unintended ways. And we have to balance the risk of this with the benefits that are perceived from genetically modified foods. I will be looking forward to your feedback on safety issues regarding genetically engineered foods soon.